I think there needs to be a little grit, a little, like the little grit that makes the pearl. I think there does need to be a little irritation somewhere to help you find some new level, some new speed, some new depth. I'm Bajan Mehta, and this is Living the Classical Life. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Living the classical life has always looked for people with the thoughtfulness of the conversations that we've had anyway, just about life and <laughs> yeah, music. So, so it's great well, to, no, but great they're, to the, they're the best. Thank you so much, first of all, uh, for the invitation. But those are the best conversations. Beijing, did it seem inevitable for you to become a musician? Uh, you come from a musical or otherwise artistic family. Did it seem like a conscious choice, or was that just what everyone did in your family? Uh, there, that's like two questions. The 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 whether it would be my career. Um, I didn't really think I thought about that. Uh, that I was in it was not a choice in the sense that it just was. The atmosphere of every day was sounds and music. You know, I kind of love sitting next to this uh, piano because my dad's a pianist. Right. And from my earliest um, memories, I remember he would practice and I would go crawling around uh, under the piano as a little baby. And I would lie underneath looking up at the sounding board and he'd be like wailing away on Diabelli Variations or something, you know, Waldstein, something. I mean, just this kind of thing. And I just loved that feeling of... Of and it's like pre-thought, sort of, of just the the vibrations coming down and enveloping me. So those are some of my very very earliest earliest memories. So yeah, it, it's it's um, it's such a natural part of my life that in that sense it wasn't a choice. My household growing up was was. You know, just having one connection like that would be fantastic. But my, wow. my household was, you know, there was a Bado, you know, and Claudio Rao and, and Bernstein well. and, and Zubin. And, you know, just like there were all these major figures of, of Western classical music sort of passing through. And the thing that was interesting about all of these people, and it's so, it's so generous, it almost makes me cry to think about it. And it's definitely how I'm going to be fashioning from this point in, in midlife, you know, to the end, um, uh, none of these great people, not one of them, ever treated me like a kid and like some, like, oh, yeah, he sings and blah, 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 blah. They took me uh, uh, seriously. They didn't, I mean, not on their level, obviously, but I never once felt like 
that the table where they were sitting was not a table where I could also sit because I would sit there and they would tell me certain things, they would talk to me and et cetera. So this gave me a kind of sense of, of, of permission that this was a world that not only could I enter, but it, it was there for me, that, that I belonged in it. So those questions, which I think many people suffer with, um, I, didn't, I didn't suffer with at all. And I never suffered at all from the idea that devoting one's, si one's life to uh, art or the arts was like a bad way to spend your life. No, this was like, this was, it was like church. If we're talking about our musical identities, how were musicians, when were musicians? You're a person who's had to remake yourself, reinvent yourself a few times. After your voice changed, you studied cello with Aldo Pariso. And then at some point, you made your debut, again, as singer, mm. as a countertenor. Mm. Did you feel like you were a person who could easily navigate these shifts? Did you go with the flow? Did you design these changes? Did they happen for a particular reason? Uh, I did not design them. Um, I, can, I can easily say that all the best things in my life were the things that I didn't design. And the things that I did design either didn't happen at all, or if they happened, they ended up actually not being the right thing for me. I had a kind of very, uh, I had a vision sort of about that I would be on a stage. And other than that, I, there was no vision. I certainly didn't set up to be a countertenor. Well, let's talk about the fact that initially uh, you were doing some work as a baritone. And you, and you described that period as not being something that was meshing. What did that feel like, that period? Oh, yeah, that was horrifying. Yeah, that was, that was, that was bad. That was bad uh, because since I had had a, a boy soprano career that was of, uh, that worked, you know, yeah. where I could access the things about music that were beautiful and I could kind of bring my soul to it and, and live in that kind of space where things uh, flowed. And then since I had had that experience to be in a situation where it was just nothing but like sand in the works and the gears just grinding on each other and oh, dreadful. Um, that was, that was particularly painful. Uh, and in the end, of course, you know, in hindsight, you go, this was one of the best things that ever happened to me. But at the time, it, it felt pretty, pretty dreadful. And it led me to this moment where I really had to decide, um, okay, life might have a lot of pain in it, you know, as well as joy, there's, but definitely there's pain in life. But does life have to be about pain and struggle every day? Okay. And after I had felt that I had really given it my all, to try and make this thing work. I got to a moment where I thought to myself, you know, I don't think life is about pain every day and twisting myself into knots every day. This is not flowing. I'm going to give myself permission to let this go. And I let it go. And then there was about a half year period where I kind of allowed myself to imagine what else my life could contain. It turned out a lot, you know? And when I removed the, the, the pressure of needing to have it be a certain thing, I found myself open to receive a lot of different things. And then eventually I found the countertenor... Um, the, the actual correct way for me to be using my voice, I never would have found it otherwise. Never, never. What were some of the things that kept you going? What, what were some of your musical inspirations? What kind of repertoire were you drawn to most? Bach. Um, Bach kept me going. It's really as simple as that. Keyboard works. Um, uh, sometimes playing some myself badly, uh, but, but mostly listening mostly listening. That's, honestly, I just was able to, uh, it, it fed everything for those, that, that, for that entire period where I wasn't, uh, I was actually actively trying not to be a musician. 
What? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was like, let's see how else I can make a living. I was producing records. I was in New York. I was, you know, in editing studios. You know, moonlighting on other people's uh, productions. You know, for Sony, CBS at that at that moment. I was actively trying to see how did that feel. Uh, and the musical side of me was just fed by listening to Bach. Okay, so back up a little bit. You said you were producing records. What? <laughs> yeah, my, my, my CV is complicated. I, I, I don't, it, it, it doesn't seem like all of it could be on it. When I was in my boy soprano time, uh, I made some records for Delos, uh, Delos Records in California. I, they're still there. Um, and I made one in particular uh, when I was uh, 14 years old. And like any 14-year-old boy, I was fascinated by, the, by all the machines and all the, just all the buttons and all those kinds of things. And the, uh, the president of the company, Amelia Haygood, um, since deceased, um, saw that, I was, that I, had, I was interested in that. And so she just kind of opened a pathway for me to explore that. And it was, again, just uh, doors that open. Sometimes they open like you know that door has opened. But often they open very, very kind of just quietly, you know. And someone lays something there and doesn't say, I think that you should go on this path. They just, they just lay it there. And it's really kind of up to you to see, you know, let your uh, imagination take you there. And I walk through that door. And what a skill. What a skill. It helped me earn money. It helped me pay for college. Uh, it, it expanded my, It paid for all of my early years in New York City, where friends of mine out of school were like, you know, bartending and waiting tables and stuff. I was, you know, moonlighting in the record business and making, you know, a lot more money um, until 1996 when it all came <laughs> crashing down and has never recovered. But let's fast forward to the Starker. Bach album. And that's, see, this is another good example. Mr. Starker could have been like, a 19-year-old? I don't want a 19-year-old producing my record. But he, he just looked and saw, he just saw something. And it was just like from my childhood time, these great figures. I've been, I've been the luckiest person alive in the mentorship, the mentors who have been there for me um, with that kind of very quiet validation, you know? He's like, yes, of course, let Bajan do it. What a validation, you know? And so that is, that is, I'm happy to say that's part of what, from this point to the end of my life. But let me underline that for the viewers. The Bach album won a Grammy. Yeah. At that point, did you think to yourself, how did I get here? You know, I, I was intending to be a, a performer. Uh, I, I was on stage in several different capacities, and now I'm winning a, an award for not being on stage. It all felt very organic. Every, every aspect of the different things that I've done in life, the cello playing, pr- producing, um, boy soprano, countertenor, orchestra playing, now a little bit conducting now that that's starting, it, it's all from the same place. It's all from this kind of inextinguishable uh, uh, curiosity about the mir- the, the, about music, about the miracle of the unendingness of music. So for me, it feels incredibly organic, not weird at all. One, one thing that I've been wondering these days, just in general, at what point do we really become musicians? At what point do we feel like we're ready? We have something to present. Are, are we a finished product at, at the time that we sort of roll ourselves out, for lack of a better word? You know, I just have to uh, uh, tell you a story that came instantly to my mind when you said, um, you know, when are we ready? And uh, Janos Starker, um, I d- did a lot of work with him um, back when I was a cellist, and uh, he said that he always found it so funny that when the stage manager would come to him before he had to go out to play a concerto or a concert and say, are you ready? And he always thought to himself in his mind, no, I'm not ready. I'm never ready, you know. And, but what he always would say was, no, but I'm not getting any readier, so I might as well go out on stage. And I've never forgotten that because I never feel ready. I never, ever, ever feel ready, which is to say, I know 
that I will achieve, the, the goals that I have in my mind, the things that I'm going for, or, you know, all that. But I've, I've kind of come to a way of thinking about it that if one has put in the work, if one has practiced enough, has sort of met the goals of the practice and put one's heart and soul into that uh, preparation stage, you do get to a point where you can say to yourself, I am ready enough. I'm ready enough to go on stage uh, and I, I deserve the attention of this public. I deserve the attention of this orchestra and this conductor or my colleagues, etc. because I'm ready enough, because I put in the work. As to feeling that one is actually ready, that is not a, a, an experience that I uh, have. If I have put in the work, and I feel that I have prepared properly um, and not wasted my preparation time, if I have, which I almost always do, but if I have, then I am 100% forgiving of myself on the stage if something doesn't go right or I forget something or whatever, because, you know, the, the permission to be a human being is actually central to giving the thing over to an audience. If the audience perceives you as kind of glacially um, perfect and put together, they don't really, they can't really get into what you're doing. So the, the humanity of it on stage, uh, yeah, then I'll be very forgiving. That When I'm not forgiving of myself is when I didn't do the work. And then I've you know, done something on stage that isn't maybe terrific. And, and then, then I do beat myself up about, about that. Not too bad, but I do. Because I think I deserve it then. Like, I didn't do the work. Since the countertenor career started, I think in the past, like, five or so years, I got to that place of feeling like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have this. I have this. I hold it lightly in my hand. I'm, it feels like play. But at the same time with that... Then comes the thought like, all right, well, if it's getting to be this easy, what's, what's next, you know? Because I think, I think there needs to be a little grit, a little, like the little grit that makes the pearl. I think there does need to be a little irritation somewhere to help you find some new level, some new speed, some new depth um, artistically. Otherwise, I think it can get a little bit um, uh, dull. You can become dull. Beijing, I don't know that much about the world of a countertenor. Does a countertenor have as much longevity in, in life? Um, can you continue singing another 20, 30 years as a countertenor? Right now we're in a hybrid period where there are a few countertenors, increasingly more countertenors, who are properly trained, properly trained, who will then sing longer. There's still a bunch who are not and will conk out you know, around 40. And this is why it's an understandable um, uh, misunderstanding among both the public and the presenting organizations and casting people. Because very often you'll go to a Baroque opera or when there's, like, there's the primo uomo and the secondo. And, like, one of them will sound, you know, like, really, like, you can feel the solidity in the voice. And the other one, maybe n not so much. And the audience is sitting there going, why has this one come across, like, a singer, and this one comes across like there's something, like he's doing something strange. That is why. Over time, that should eventually uh, uh, disappear. There's really no reason why. I mean, I think if, if my voice were conking out before I were, you know, between 60 and 65, I will have done something wrong. Based on its health today, I don't see any reason why that should be. The secondary question is, do I want to continue doing that until 60, 65? Personally, that's a, you know, kind of a personal question. Um, uh, and then the other part of the question is, how do opera houses look at it? You know, they've never been in the position to have to, to right. be hiring you know, uh, a 55-year-old countertenor to sing Cesare or something. You know, when I sing Cesare later this year, I'll be 53, the age of the historical Cesare. I can't wait. Can't wait. I'm going to, that's going to be in every paper. I'm going to make sure that that's in every paper because I do want to make this point that, you know, it doesn't automatically just vanish because of 40. It's about training and proper training, like everything. Beijing, you, you described your, your upbringing 
as being one where you were surrounded by all these great musicians, mm -hmm. was there one in particular, a couple of musicians who really, really inspired you, who showed you that that's in fact kind of the real way to make music, that's, that's the life I want to have in music? Oh my God. <laughs> um, I don't know why this makes me cry. Uh, <laughs> that's so funny. Yes. Um, Arlene Auger and Krista Ludwig, who just passed away. I'm so sorry. Um, these two in particular. Um, because of exactly what I've been talking about. They cared about what was important. They cared about showing up for their instruments. They kept their techniques beautiful through hard work. They sacrificed for it and made uh, beautiful work their entire lives. Uh, they were calm about it. <clears throat> they didn't take themselves too seriously. Just, do, need I go on? I mean, you know, it, it's, and I think, I mean, we lost Arlene too early. I was lucky to do two of her records, too, when I was young. Yeah. Her love song record, in particular. And I think it, it's not just that uh, Crystal Ludwig just passed away a couple weeks ago. It, it, it's, it's also that I think this way of thinking about music and believing in it and devoting oneself to the things that, that, that matter, I do find that that is on its way out. It seems to be on its way out. I fear that it's on its way out. And there are not careers like Krista Ludwig's anymore. I am in year 25 um, a, a, as a countertenor. I've been on the road at, for 35, if I, if I include my boy soprano time. And to, by today's standards, this is an astonishment of a career. All right, it is long, I've done everything, blah, 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 okay? In Krista Ludwig's time, if someone retired at 25, or people were like moving on to the next younger things, people would say, what happened to him or her? Like, oh, something must have gone wrong with their voice. Because the idea that at 20, after 25 years of career, like you don't have anything more to say, or like you're not deep enough or all that kind of stuff. And you, you look, I just looked at Krista's uh, farewell recital at, at, at the Musikverein just the other day by chance on, on YouTube. Well, not by chance, she passed away and I wanted to remember some things. And there she was. I think she was, it was in 94. I, I think she was something like 75 then. And there she was. Just and the calmness of this production based on proper knowledge of, of what she was doing. I'm, I, I want this not to go away. Finally, Bejan, I'm curious to know if there was, if, if we keep in mind the fact that you've done music in so many different ways, is there one moment, if that's possible to isolate, one moment that was an affirmation for you that this is why I do it, this is who I am, that's a moment of bliss. Jesus, are you like Barbara Walters? You know, like, is, is, do you just make all your guests cry? Is that, is that, is that, is that <laughs> I've always wanted to pull a, an Oprah card. I just, I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm sorry. What was the question? Was there a moment when, when... A moment of bliss, a moment of affirmation that this defined your life, that you knew that this is your, your inner fire. I'll just tell you the first thing that came to my mind, because usually that is a... That's the thing. Because, you know, the thing about being a musician, I'm... I'm not sure people can really relate. Like I've just, it's just like mother's milk. It's like the air I breathe, and the water that I drink. It's just so a part of everything that, that I can't really even, like it wasn't, there was no moment where I'm like, oh, and now I'm a musician. Like I would be a musician even if, I, if it weren't my career, you know? So like I can't look at it that way. 
and I know that no one else can really, very few people can, you know, relate to that. Uh, but to your question, I would say there was, there was a moment I was singing, um, I was singing in Salzburg. It was in 2005. And my career was already very launched, and there I was, and, you know, all of that. And uh, I was the, the shiny thing, you know? We all go through this moment of being the shiny thing. And I was the shiny thing. And it, it, the, it was Mitridate, um, and uh, Mark Minkowski was conducting. And at the end of that opera is a, a, an exquisite aria. Mozart was 14 when he wrote the opera, and there are two pieces in the opera that are actual masterpieces. Because um, the, the work itself has, you can tell it's still genius, but it was, it's, you know, it's not Notze or something. You know, it's, but there are two arias that are great. One is for my brother's character, and one is for my character, Jadal Yoki. And it's the very end. And it's about 10 minutes long, very slow, and an aria of contrition. And it is the first one of Mozart's um, father-son fight and Versöhnung uh, sort of um, um, arias. And the character is, is, is turning over a new leaf and begging for forgiveness. And Mark uh, had a very particular view on this, this aria, and he wanted it to be very, very slow. Uh, slower than than had been done before. Uh, and I honestly didn't know if I could do it. I really didn't. I mean, it was when he, when he started giving me the first tempo in the first rehearsals, I thought, I'm like, I can't do that. I can't do it. I can't do it. He's like, you'll get there. And he, and he, but he would not make it faster. He's like, no, no, you will get there. You will get there. And I kind of knew like, oh, I'm not going to be able to get out of this. And um, so I worked on it like I've not worked on anything else ever. And I did get there. But in answer to your question, the act of performing it, spinning these just incredibly long lines that just go on and on, and you have to kind of hold them with not just all your technique, but also with the strength of your idea, the strength of the conviction, which in this case was forgiveness. Love and forgiveness. And it was the first moment, and of course it makes everything, it makes time stop. If you can manage it, it makes time stop. And there, I had a moment then in not every performance, but in about three of the performances where I could feel that the entire audience, the entire orchestra, Mark, whoever was backstage, etc., was lifted up by this thing. And I was not even, and I'm, I don't mean by me, I was also, I was like watching myself do it. it, was, it I wasn't, I was like watching it happen. So I was also enjoying this, an, an astonishment of music and art. Um, and th so that's what came to my mind when you said that. Because afterwards I thought to myself, Okay, well, you know, if that's, if, if that's in you, or maybe I should more aptly say, if you can be that open and vulnerable to a scary moment like that, then maybe this is, then in fact you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Bajun, thanks for joining the show. My pleasure. It was great. And I wish you many more years of musical joy. Thank you.